Hello, everybody, and welcome to the SIG Windows Maintainer Track talk um, as part of KubeCon and CNCFCon North America 2023. And we'll start with some introductions. I am Mark Rossetti. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, and I am the co-chair of SIG Windows. Um, I also do a lot of stuff in uh, the release team for Kubernetes and pop into various SIGs to kind of interact with them from a Windows perspective. Um, professionally, I work in Azure on a team that uh, mainly contributes to open source projects and Kubernetes and the CNCF. Uh, hey, folks. My name is Arvind. Uh, I'm a staff engineer at OpenShift um, at Red Hat. I'm also the co-sig chair of SIG Windows along with uh, Mark here. So we have, um, this is our agenda for the day. We are going to start off with some Kubernetes updates that are specific to Windows and we'll soon move to ecosystem updates around Windows uh, projects that are connected to Kubernetes. Um, and then we're going to shine a spotlight on our contributors, That's which is, and they're the folks who keep the SIG um, going. And hopefully, we'll give you all some time for Q&A at the end. Um, yeah, so first, we're going to do talk a little bit about some of the updates that are happening for, do you want to? For, for SIG Windows inside of the Kubernetes project. Um, so for people who aren't familiar with how kind of code flows in the Kubernetes project, um, there's this process of getting larger features into the code base um, that follows this KEP process or this Kubernetes enhancement proposal process. And um, that is generally required for anything that's user facing or interacts with multiple components in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And those are um, anything that goes through that cut process is um, progresses through various feature stages, um, alpha, beta, and then stable. Um, so most of the updates that we'll talk about in this section are the progressions of the keps that SIG Windows has in flight. And for each one of the keps, um, there's a, a quick link here to get to the full enhancement proposal where you can see discussions. And if you're interested, comment on it, um, check the status of it and everything else. And uh, these slides are on Sketch, so any of the links, like, don't worry about it. You can just download them later. Um, the first enhancement that we'll talk about is this um, support for image pulls per runtime class. And um, this one is maybe a little bit technical, but it does enable a pretty big feature, um, user-facing feature that we've been asked to support, and that is Hyper-V isolated Windows containers and Kubernetes clusters. So today in Container D, um, the primary runtime or container runtime that we use, for Windows, um, Hyper-V isolated Windows containers are supported, but there's a lot of work that's needed in Kubernetes to kind of uh, close all of these feature gaps here. And a big one is, is that um, there's a lot of differences in the container runtime um, for you know, pulling the container, snapshotting the container, and just managing the general life cycle of the container images, depending on if you pull a process isolated container or if you pull a container for running it in process isolated mode or Hyper-V isolated mode, and also if you're targeting the different operating systems um, on a node. So if you want to run a Windows Server 2019 container and a Windows Server 2022 container side by side on the same node, um, the container runtime needs to know which of those base images to keep around. So um, we started some work here, and there's a feature that went in. Um, it was introduced as an alpha feature this release, a 129, and it's all of the, the kept was approved and all of the implementation PR has went through um, to progress it to an alpha state. So after this release, it should be available for testing um, with some setup, which is, will be documented here. Um, but yeah, so this, this kept um, kind of required work in a first updates to the CRI, API, container D, and um, the kubelet and a couple other parts of Kubernetes. So um, we're kind of excited this, is, this went in as alpha so quickly and hope to kind of progress this pretty quickly because it's straightforward and it does enable a pretty big um, user scenario that we're targeting. Um, the next one that I'll give an update on is this kept that was um, driven through SigNode, but SIG Windows is helping to uh, kind of progress this and make sure Windows is supported. And this is this C advisor list container and pod stats. So this is a, uh, there's, there's a number of different metrics and stats that get exposed in, in various Kubernetes components. Um, some come from the container runtime. You can get your own stats from Node Exporter. Some come from the kubelet. Um, some of them get cached and exposed in the metrics APIs and such. And we, we've seen some issues where um, for Windows containers, what you see when you're looking at like the node stats versus what you see from the metrics APIs, which is what your auto scaling um, algorithms are based on, can get out of sync. And um, so th this, this cap is really aimed to help 
uh, consolidated all this so there's a single source of truth for um, which metrics are being reported and where the, all of the different higher level components are getting the metrics from. So Windows support was added for this in 128, which was um, released as part of the last release. Um, it is still an alpha feature, so you can turn that on. But we're hoping that this fix fixes a lot of inconsistencies that have been reported over time around uh, node metrics and those scaling workloads. And this is targeting GA in 130, where it will be widely available, because um, I know some cloud providers tend to not enable different features until things reach stable. So the next, the last one I want to talk about is not uh, quite at the point where um, there's a cap around this too, but it is important and we've been seeing a lot more, I'm not going to say a ton, but more instances of a particular issue, which I'll explain, as more and more people start adopting and ramping up their Windows workloads in larger Kubernetes clusters. And that's the commit memory. So to go uh, kind of on a little bit of a technical, uh, on the technical side of this too, when you schedule a Windows container in Kubernetes and you specify a resource limit in your pod spec, you can specify like I want you know, 500 megabytes of memory. Under the hood, that gets, um, when Windows containers get started up, all of the processes under that Windows container get um, grouped in a job object. And the Windows APIs for job objects allow us to enforce limits on that job object. And the memory limit is only enforced on the amount of commit memory those processes are uh, consuming. So because Kubernetes was mostly Linux first and Linux, Linux uh, focused, um, pretty much all of like, the stats that get reported and, um, and any of the metrics that you're being reported are working on, being reported on your commit set, or your working set bytes for all of your containers here. Now, under a lot of circumstances, your commit memory usage and your working set usage are going to be pretty even, but there are a number of e either allocation patterns or um, usage patterns, or, and depending on what type of memory you're allocating, where you can have disparities between those two. So most notably um, in workloads that are using a lot of um, commit memory and the working set memory is lagging, we've seen cases where people set up you know, auto scaling um, for, for those workloads, expecting that when the memory usage reaches a certain kind of threshold, they're going to have the horizontal pod auto scaler come, um, divide out that work, and then things should just continue. But we've seen cases where since the higher level Kubernetes components don't, um, aren't aware of the commit memory, um, the horizontal pod, like the auto scaling hasn't kicked in yet and then commit memory will go up and you'll start to run to out of memory uh, scenarios in your Windows containers, um, which is definitely not what we want. So there was a, a number of discussions between people in the com Kubernetes community to figure out the best way to kind of reconcile this. And where we're at today is there's been pull requests into the CRI API and in container D so that your both commit set, or your, your commit memory and your working set memory are being reported up to the kubelet. And that's all been um, completed and, and wired up now. The next steps here are to kind of drive a discussion about how we want to handle this in the higher level Kubernetes components like all of the auto scaling uh, mechanisms. And this is kind of one of those cross components uh, the features that we're going to have to probably drive through a cap. Um, so hopefully since all of the groundwork has been done, this cap will be started in the next release. Um, if anybody's interested in this, please you know, stay tuned and look into, like, check in the SIG window Slack and things, which we'll give resources on later for more information and kind of input on how you think this should work. So the next feature that we would like to talk about is in-place pod vertical autoscaling. This is a feature that is going alpha with Windows support in 129. Um, as, as you folks can see, it's been a long journey. Uh, it took around four years from inception to the, you know, the implementation being uh, committed and checked in. Uh, the KEP was initially driven through SIG node, and there was a lot of uh, support from SIG windows in getting the, the Windows pieces going for, for this. The details about this feature is basically that you can now add CPU and memory resources to Windows pods. And when you change them around, you don't need to restart the pod itself. They take into effect without the pod being restarted. 
And this is really useful because, you know, there are less chances of your, you know, your pod getting an evicted from the node, landing up in another node. So this is a really cool feature. Um, support for this has been added to the Containerd runtime. And we have recently added Windows end-to-end -end supports for this. So you've, I really encourage folks to try it out. And if you have any issues, open bugs, um, and we'll get them fixed. Next we have is a feature that is near and dear to my heart because this is something I added in, as alpha in 127. This also had a fairly long journey, it took a couple of years to go from you know, getting the KEP merge to having the implementation done. So node log viewer is basically a kubelet API that you can access using the proxy endpoint that's uh, uh, exposed by the kubelet. You sort of, so in other words, you don't go through the kube API server to uh, access this endpoint. To enable this feature, you need to do two things. One is you need to enable a feature gate uh, called node log query. And the second is you need to add a kubelet option called enable system log query. Uh, the reason for this is that the feature is a little bit sensitive because it is going to give you access to the logs of your services that are running on both your Linux and Windows nodes. Uh, so because of this, we want users to be really aware that, hey, I'm actually enabling this feature for all my nodes for you know, debugging purposes and for collecting information when something is going wrong in your node. So it's pretty powerful. What you can do is I've, I've pointed uh, folks at an example here where I'm trying to go to a node called node one example, and I'm trying to grab the kubelet logs. So this command is going to return all the kubelet logs on node one example. Uh, the query is, a, is, is pretty powerful. You can add more options that say, hey, give me all the logs from a certain date to a certain uh, time. Uh, so you can get subsets. You can even do queries like, hey, give me all the logs for the kubelet that have, I don't know, a term called error in it, and it'll just give you the logs which have the word error in it. Um, so uh, I would really like folks to try this out, give us feedback. Um, I'm also working on a kubelet plugin to make this feature a little bit more accessible. Um, and I think the plugin, what it'll let you do is it's going to make it a little bit more powerful. You could say, hey, give me the kubelet logs from all your Linux nodes or all your Linux workers or all your Windows workers. So you could do a little bit more um, uh, you know, selective uh, logging of uh, any services that you run. And this is not restricted to just you know, kubelet logs. You could, you know, if, you, if you want containerd logs, you can get it. Um, on the Windows side, I know that there are some services that run for GMSA. You could even grab logs for those services. So it's a pretty powerful utility, especially when it comes to debugging issues that are happening in the load. Um, you know, your CNI doesn't come up. Uh, you can look at your kubelet log to figure out what's going on. You don't have to like figure out SSH access to your nodes. You can just uh, you know hit this endpoint. Um, next up, we have ecosystem updates. Yeah, so what we just talked about were updates in the, the Kubernetes project itself. Um, we wanted to give some updates in the ecosystem, the, like the Windows Container ecosystem, because um, that definitely wouldn't have Kubernetes without all these different components. Um, the first one that uh, I'm excited about is the, the Windows support for the K3S agent. Um, so pretty recently, the, K, uh, the K3S project has uh, kind of finally, I shouldn't say finally, I'll say finally because the feature request came in, I think, 2019 to support Windows nodes. So it's been a long journey um, to get here um, so that you can configure a Windows VM and um, with K3S, the K3S, run the K3S agent on it and join it to the node. Um, there's this one in pretty recently, but almost immediately backport PRs were open. So if you're running K3S for any um, in, any scenarios, um, starting with 126, you can use uh, join Windows nodes to the cluster. It's uh, pretty simple to do. You just make a little YAML file, like the definition here, um, point it at the control plane for your K3S cluster, and run the agent file. Uh, this has been tested with Flannel. Um, we know there's many other you know, CNI solutions. Um, I think that anybody in the project or in SIG Windows would really appreciate it if people um, you know, wanted to test and make sure other CNI solutions work with that too. So it's also a good opportunity to contribute. Um, the next kind of uh, topic that I want to talk about was build kit support for Windows. Um, I don't know how familiar people are with, with build kit, but 
if you use Docker build, um, for the past couple of versions of Docker, you're actually using a, the build kit build engine under the hood. If you're building Linux containers on a Linux machine, if you're building Linux containers um, in WSL with Docker desktop. But if you're building Windows containers in any of the different environments, you're using kind of an older version of a Docker build engine that was built specifically to build Windows containers. Now, over the past couple of years, there's been a lot of uh, definitely a lot of improvements around build kits to help you know optimize your build execution for your container images by doing like parallelized graph queries and execution, um, much better image caching, the ability to push directly to, to image stores, and all sorts of benefits here. So this is another issue that was open, I think, around 2020 about let's get like what would it take to get build kit support for building Windows containers on any of these platforms. Um, and there were a lot of discussions for a couple of years, and recently, um, I'd say the past six or eight months, there's actually been a lot of movement to get this to happen. Um, I'll be clear, this isn't, um, this isn't like ready yet. I think that you can kind of cobble together a bunch of different components to, to get it to work, but it's not quite ready for um, just install Docker and, and use this. But this is an example of like a pretty complicated problem, and Lots of different PRs from lots of different individuals that are all making progress to get this to work. Um, so in this particular case, it started with the need to build an executor to run your run commands. Um, and that was implemented in container D. And, one, and then there was also you know, a number of changes in various other components to support that. And then a lot of changes in of various Mobi, Mobi repositories to support Windows paths and then just make sure everything lines up and stuff. So this is a, this is a, like, a lot of people have been asking for this because of all the benefits Build Kits brings and we hope that this will be available to everybody soon. So next up we have um, Calico. Calico is a CNI available for Kubernetes and recently in version 3.27 they have added um, general availability for running Calico using Windows host process containers. Uh, if anybody here is not aware of what a host process container is, it's the equivalent of Linux privilege containers for Windows. Um, there's a great presentation given by Mark and James at uh, the previous KubeCon, so please look that up and that'll give you all the details you need about host process containers. So what's happening now with the Calico project is they now have their CNI plugin and node container images built with within the Calico project, so you can, you can pull those images from there. Um, they have also added support to the Tigera operator, which is the operator that manages um, their pods and any containers that they have uh, running on their different nodes. So Windows support has been uh, added to that also. Uh, they have really good documentation, so if you go to the Calico website, uh, they have detailed notes on how you can use Calico with uh, Windows nodes now. So reach out to Project Calico for more information. Next up, we have contributor spotlights. Any SIG is not gonna be around if there are not enough contributors. And so this is the reason why we would like to shine a spotlight on uh, contributors. We're gonna focus mainly on folks who have joined us uh, recently and have added uh, new features and helped us fix bugs. First up, we have Kirtan Ashok. Uh, she's a software engineer who works at Mark at Microsoft. Um, she was the person who started on working in the uh, image pull per runtime class feature that Mark was talking about recently. Um, and she was a first time contributor to Kubernetes. And she went through the whole journey of, you know, starting a KEP, uh, discussing with multiple SIGs about how this um, feature should work. Not only did she have to talk to SIG windows, she had to speak with the SIG node, and externally she had to also talk to some of the CRI folks, um, in particular with the Containerd project, uh, because this feature actually spans multiple Git GitHub repos. So she had to contribute in multiple places to get this uh, feature going. So this also shows how you could enter the Kubernetes community through SIG windows and get this broad exposure to you know, different projects out there. Um, so I've pointed at some of the caps and some of the PRs that she had to open and get merged uh, to get this feature going. Um, so uh, really great work from her. Uh, next up, we have Mansi Kulkarni, who is um, in here in the crowd uh, with us. 
She's a software engineer at Red Hat working on Windows containers. Um, she recently worked on implementing Windows support for the pod and container stats from CRI. This was needed to complete the C advisorless feature that uh, C advisorless uh, container and pod stats feature that Mark was talking about. Uh, this is another example of how you can get involved. Uh, instead of having to work on you know, a feature from end to end, you could also show up and contribute and drive something to completion. Uh, again, enabling you to get exposure to the community, um, getting you more uh, knowledge about Kubernetes in general. So another way you can, you know, you can start working and contributing to Kubernetes. Um, Monty has also been the CI signal shadow for 128 and 129. And she's also been involved in the test info project. The, uh, the other couple of spotlights we want to shine are on Tatenda and Kulwant. They both worked on Windows operational readiness on EKS. Uh, they both work at uh, AWS. If you're wondering what Windows operational readiness is, it's basically a set of standards and a set of properties that um, if you apply to your Windows node, it's, it basically states that your Windows node is now ready to accept production workloads. So, Great work from uh, both of them. We're happy to have them on board. And now I'll pass it back to Mark. And now we'll talk a little bit about uh, ways that other people can contribute. Um, kind of, as Arvin mentioned, no SIG can really contribute without, um, without the contributors there. And um, SIG Windows has, um, there, there are maintainers here. Um, we could definitely use more contributors. And it's always a better use of kind of the maintainer's time to try and mentor and bring on new contributors just so that we can scale and continue to grow. So we'd like to, if anybody's interested, highlight some of the ways that they can help contribute. Um, each SIG in the Kubernetes community has a landing page in the Kubernetes community repository that uh, kind of lists their SIG charter, lists uh, links to their meeting notes, uh, what time their meetings are and everything. Um, visit the SIG Windows page if you're interested in finding more information. Um, we do have a contributing guide for SIG Windows um, for the Kubernetes project specifically, how to do run additional test validation on any of your Windows changes and kind of talking about a lot of nuances around how to, how, how like Windows containers work if you're specifically for contributing to the Kubernetes project, but there's also a lot of information on the Kubernetes website about, um, you know, differences and what, what's enabled, what's not enabled for Windows workloads in your, your cluster. Um, we also have a weekly community meeting every Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. PST, which is my local time zone, um, which is open for anybody to join. And we do often, if there's a desire, have pairing sessions after that too. So if anybody's interested in coming and looking at a problem, looking at some either test failures or unique kind of instances or behaviors, um, many of us are always welcome, willing to kind of hang around and kind of just go deep and help people with that too. Um, we do have a list of issues and bugs that anybody can uh, look at, which we maintain in some periodic uh, bug triage meetings. So um, one of the interesting things about the Windows SIG is we're kind of a more horizontal SIG. So um, we do have a charter of kind of supporting Windows workloads and Kubernetes, but that does often cross a lot of different um, SIG boundaries. Like we interact with SIG auth, oh, SIG security, SIG node, SIG networking, um, auto scaling, things like that too. So if you're, don't think that you just need to know Windows expertise if you want to contribute to SIG Windows, um, there's a lot of opportunities to go deep if you want to technically and, and focus in one area, but there's also a lot of um, kind of opportunities to gain exposure in various aspects of the Kubernetes project. Um, kind of specifically lately, we've been, we'd really, if anybody has Windows networking knowledge, that's some area that I think we're always kind of short on help with and we'd really, we would definitely value any contributions with that too. Um, we do do a lot of Windows testing and we're trying to make sure that, that um, everything stays stable. Um, that could be a good opportunity if anybody's interested in learning how the larger Kubernetes test infrastructure um, kind of mechanisms work and everything. And we do maintain the documentation on kates.io for Windows workloads, but if anybody is interested in some non, uh, like coding contributions, we always value additional documentation there. And I personally find that having people go through the documentation and, and like to realize some of the shortcomings, if there are any as things evolve, is a much, 
the kind of a rewarding feedback cycle for improve, getting the docs improved rather than us just saying, oh, you need to go and like, here's what you need to change differently. Um, and there's uh, multiple sub-projects in the Kubernetes project that um, kind of have opportunities for sub-project owners if anybody is wanting to contribute consistently. Um, one other thing that I'll call out is recently there were um, a Windows CVE and um, just wanted to, to call out here that you know, these things do happen. Um, and this is another opportunity to contribute. Um, the Kubernetes project does have a security response committee and there's guidelines for how to disclose information. If you're interested in just trying to break things or do some penetration testing, that's always also uh, welcome, a welcome contribution. But uh, please just make sure that you disclose these uh, responsibly. And if there's a, a link to the website there, if you find a you know, security vulnerability in any of the Kubernetes components. And there's also bug bounties for um, finding bugs in the Kubernetes community. So you can maybe get rewarded for that too. Lastly, um, here's more, just more information in the SIG. This is more for reference if you're downloading the slides. We've got a Slack channel in the Kubernetes Slack. We've got a mailing list. We've got uh, a YouTube playlist with all of the community meetings, um, links to some of the various SIG Windows meetings, the, the teams, and the contact information for all of the, the leads on the Slack, on Slack and on GitHub. So now uh, we'll leave some time for Q&A if anybody has any questions. There's a microphone there, if you, so it's not recording. Hello, is this on? I'll just speak very loud. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, the log node viewer, viewer. Um, so you showed the API there, but is that gonna be in kubectl as well, for customers to be able to grep through logs on the node? Oh, there you go. Uh, so it's not gonna be, so you can make a raw call yeah. to the API itself, but it's not gonna get native support into kubectl. Um, that's a decision we made after a bunch of architectural uh, discussions that we had. So this is why I'm going to introduce the kubectl plugin that you can then use. So it'll be more natural. I, I don't know. You, I'm going to, I plan on calling it node logs. So it'll be something like kubectl node logs and then, you know, whatever options I'm going to expose there. So that is, I think, the next step for that uh, project. You. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions, folks? Right, going right, once, going twice. Thank you for coming, folks.